Welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your Shuffle Goblin host, Daniel Green, and today, whoo, buddy, are we gonna nail our way through some fantasy news. And we're gonna be kicking it off today with, of course, the first look at season two of The Wheel of Time. Now, a couple of these images, if you've been in the inner circle of Wheel of Time snooping, have floated about the internet for a bit, but we have officially gotten our first trailer sneak peek and look at Elaine Tricond, as well as our new Matt. I'm gonna reemphasize one last time because I know I'll get comments about it. I don't know what happened to Barney Harris, and I think we should probably just leave the guy alone. He didn't just leave the show. He left social media. The guy does not want your attention. But that brings us to New Matt, played by Donald Flynn. And for those of you who are aware exactly what happens in the second and third Wheel of Time book, I think a lot of us are left wondering if they're going to try and adjust events in the series to justify, in a way that could be, a change in Matt's look that wouldn't exactly be in the book, but the book provides an avenue to justify it, or if they're just going to be like, New Matt, like they did with Rhodey in MCU. And as for the Elaine first look, I like it quite a bit. Now for the Moraine interview with Roseman Pike interviewing Moraine that was included in this article is actually kind of cute though. Be aware, it does have spoilers for the end of season one with a significant book change. I like that she's wearing her blue Aja armor more style. And they also did pay good attention to that in the show. I've criticized the show ad nauseum, but the costume design in terms of realizing the Ajas especially, on point. My impression for the images we got outside of the ones they highlighted in this article for season two are some of them look pretty good, but then there's also shots with like people around a table that looked a bit goofy and Renaissance fairy to me. So I'll withhold my judgment, of course, until I actually see the season, but yeah, I still have hope that my favorite fantasy series of all time could get a season two that's better than season one. And somehow that statement is going to make someone mad at me. I think the safest bet we can say though is visually it will be more solid because season two didn't get boned by a global pandemic like season one did. Though I have no idea what they've done with the budget of the show since season one, so who knows? But we are going to sweep on away from the Wheel of Time news and go ahead and talk about Shadow Speaker, the latest release from Ni Okorfor, the first book in the Desert Magicians duology. Shadow Speaker, drawn by Greg Roof, will be released September 26 of 2023. Deep mysticism, a new type of desert, spontaneous forests, Polyandry, fast cars, the power of Gerwal. This novel has many lives. And in terms of African futurism, that's actually a genre I'm ashamedly very under-read in, so if you have any recommendations, leave them in the comments down below. And thank you, Neocore4, for actually shouting out your cover artist in the tweet. I really hope everyone starts doing that. Your cover artists deserve love. And if you are a Watership Down fan, you're going to be getting a graphic novel adaptation of the series released October 17th of 2023. Does that mean the one scene... I you know what? We'll just have to wait and see. But continuing the exciting release news, we have also had it announced from Jim Butcher that the next book in the Cinder Spire series will be released in 2023. The Olympian Affair, book two in the Cinder Spires, will be released on November 7th, apparently with a new paperback of the first book coming out in October. And before we get into the big industry controversial news of the day, we're gonna go ahead and talk about the fact that Patrick Leo got to announce a deluxe edition for Child of the Night Guild by Andy Ploquin. The Kickstarter campaign for this will start soon. Well, I do think this does look really good. Is it normal to see a Kickstarter without an official launch date? I find that a bit odd. But finally, we're going to get into the first big old controversial piece of news today, and that is going to be the lawsuit leveled against Amazon and the Tolkien estate for $250 million, alleging that they stole from a book titled Fellowship of the King, written by an author whose name I'm not gonna bother putting in this because this just reeks of a desperate cash grab or attention grab for me, but let's go ahead and dig into the details. Now, leading up to this lawsuit, apparently the author of Fellowship of the King repeatedly tried to get their book in the hands of someone affiliated with the Tolkien estate. This was after apparently having a lawyer reach out to the estate to get them to collaborate with him and just, you know, 
a pattern of behavior that absolutely makes me want to get on this author's side. Totally unrelated to what we were just talking about, but if you were planning a fraudulent lawsuit against one of the biggest companies and, you know, franchises in the world, where you quickly registered your new book that was inspired by Tolkien right after the announcement of the Rings of Power show, if you were trying desperately to prove in a court of law they stole from you for that massively expensive show, you would repeatedly do everything you could in your power to try and get that book provably in the hands of the people who you would then be alleging stole from you. This is total hypothetical, completely unrelated to what we we're talking about though. Excuse me, moving on, never mind, no big deal. Finally resulting in the $250 million lawsuit where the author is claiming that they stole heavily from his book, Fellowship of the King, which I'm sure did not take heavily from anything else. Which my favorite part of this is the author is clarifying that his book, while inspired by Tolkien, has original characters and concepts throughout it. Which is a bit confusing with this lawsuit because with all the criticism you can level against Rings of Power, it's using Tolkien's characters and stories. Yet this author has said their own work is distinct from Tolkien's and does not have his characters and events in it. So which is it, my guy? Now there is a claim that goes so far here that apparently Rings of Power directly took language from their book, which does seem damning until you realize that there are so many lines of dialogue that go throughout pretty much every single show. Having someone say like, oh, you took a specific line, doesn't really mean that much when there's so much language in fantasy books that lines up with each other. And the big final bow on top is a claim that Rings of Power took from their book cover, which let's get into my reaction to that claim. Uh, all right, let's look into the cover. You know, he said they pulled directly from his cover, right? So, uh, oh Jesus. Let's see the Fellowship of the King cover. What do we got? Dude, there's literally not a dragon in Rings of Power. What the f are you talking about? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That's a big old nopsy dopsy, my friend. <laughs> so. Smelling some bulls. So maybe I did a little bit of digging into the publisher of the Fellowship of the King, Fractal Books, and I found their website, which to their credit has several books listed. Good job as a publisher, except only one of them is actually out. That would be the Fellowship of the King. Another has a pre-order, which great for you, except what happens when you click buy now, uh, you can't buy it because that's not out yet. And there's also some additional things where if, if I go to your about page, whose art is that? Did you license that art? Where'd you get that from? I'm just asking questions. I, I just really like the art. So I'd love to know the artist you paid to use that, right? You paid to use that, right? This strikes me as very similar to a lawsuit that Disney had to deal with not too long ago, where after they announced the intention and premise of an upcoming movie, someone very quickly put out a children's book that matched that premise so that once the movie was done, they could claim copyright violation. And a lot of the dates in this situation to me, allegedly, are very similar. I am eager almost joyful when I get to criticize Amazon. But here, this just seems like someone very desperate for attention and or money. But moving on into more positive Lord of the Rings news, if you still have positive feelings towards Wizards of the Coast and B&B, &B. but we are in fact getting a Lord of the Rings skinning of the fifth edition of D&D. &D. Yes, there is already a Middle Earth RPG out there, but if you are a diehard 5e fan, this means you get that Lord of the Rings skinning within your own comfy cozy system. Importantly, though, 
no, this isn't Wizards of the Coast that will be publishing this system, and instead it is going to be Free League Publishing. And my favorite part of all of this, because of the backlash Wizards of the Coast faced with their update to the OGL coverage here, if you want to see what that was all about, Free League Publishing isn't going to have to pay them a dime for this new edition of 5e within the Lord of the Rings Middle Earth setting. Now, just to clear up some confusion I have seen around this, Free League has put out Lord of the Rings RPG books before, but this is the first one that's going to be 5e. So if you would like to finally read the word hobbits and not halflings, in official 5e settings, you will be able to do so. But now the story that's going to get me the clicks of vampire fans, and that is going to be that yes, Twilight is getting readapted, baby, into a TV series. Over at Lionsgate Television, far too early to say anything more beyond that, but I am so excited for this. No, I'm not the biggest Twilight fan, but I like content that's weird and I can comment on. And if there is one series that is strange, it's the series that involves an adult werewolf imprinting in a very romantic way on a baby born from a 16 year old currently in a relationship with a 100 year old. That's, that's, I, I got a lot to say about that. And in the next adaptation news, Sirens of the City has been ordered to be adapted over at Boom Studios. This is a long long running urban fantasy series that uses the fantastical to comment on real world issues like bodily autonomy. And if there is a case to be made for adaptations no matter what being good because they get people interested in the series to pick it up, this is a textbook example of that for me because after reading the description, this one got thrown high into my TBR. I just love urban fantasy and I really like when the fantastical genre is used to commentate on real world things in interesting ways so super down. And do you like your audio? Gravic. Well, if you do, you should be excited to hear that Magic Bytes has officially been adapted and released over graphic audio. I still get asked every time I talk about graphic audio, what is graphic audio? Typically, it means a whole cast of actors bringing the story to life with added in music and sound effects to essentially make a movie without visuals. It's not my favorite unless it's done in a more held back way, but I totally understand the appeal and this seems to be a rapidly rising uh, popular area for audiobooks. That's enough! That's enough! Back I say! For all the fun pop stories, and let's get into one of the more serious industry pieces of news, because it seems like another writer's strike is potentially on the table, with well over 95% of writers agreeing to a strike in a recent vote if their demands are not met. Obviously, I'm on the side of the writers here. Writing, big surprise, vital part of storytelling, and while so many actors and directors get so much of the glory, often writers are underpaid for their work and certainly not appreciated within the industry, but I'm happy to say my gut instinct is they are likely to get most if not all of their demands because since the last writer's strike in Hollywood, it's only become clearer how detrimental that was to so many projects ongoing during that time. More so than ever, writers have leverage and it's even stated with their intent in this vote, it's just to hammer home just how much leverage they have. They can cause another strike if they wanted to, the argument really just boils down to me of like value proposition, right? If the writers leave, things go to hell. So if they are saying we need to be paid more, you kind of have to meet their demands just as much as you do with actors. I think they are an equally important part of the puzzle. And with a lot of the focus of the talk here being focused on streaming, it makes sense that in recent years with so much of the industry shifting and rights and payments that are now tied into streaming becoming more and more valuable. Yeah, the Writers Guild needs to sit down and renegotiate. Then there was also also an article that dropped that made me go, ah, no. Self-published authors earn more than traditionally published counterparts, according to Ali Report. And this was not a very well researched or put together piece because yes, if you look at this data in a very specific way, you can say on price point, on average, with how much an individual book sale benefits the author, some indie authors absolutely do make more than their trad published counterparts, but they are not likely to actually reach those numbers by any means. And the data pool this article pulled from was just 2000 respondents, which is not enough. But let me just make this clear. If you're a traditionally published author, no, you're not gonna be making as much as Sanderson, but you'll probably have something pushing your books behind them. 
you're an indie published author. Odds are you will sell nothing. That is not good. I hate that. That is awful. But most indie published books do not really find an audience. It's really sad. It's why you need to develop a marketing strategy while you are writing your book and grind hard to get your book in readers hands. I am happy to point at one piece from this article though I do agree with and I think is a good thing. The amount of readers who are willing to pick up indie books is on the rise. And so I do think the future of indie authors, especially if we're able to combat the AI side of indie author invasion right now do have a bright future in front of them. But the way this article's framed is it kind of makes it seem like taking the indie publish route is the easy road to a higher paycheck. Absolutely not. But getting on into just straight factual entertainment news, Sandman season two has officially been done being written and a Galaxy Quest series is in the works over at Paramount Plus, which I have no idea how that will turn out. I do like the Galaxy Quest movie, but it does make sense for Paramount Plus to be the ones doing this because obviously that is where Star Trek lives now. Speaking of Star Trek and Paramount Plus, Michelle Yeoh is going to be helming her own spinoff of Star Trek and getting her own series. And while I certainly have not been the biggest biggest fan of Star Trek recently, Michelle Yeoh, always a win. I just hope Section 31 helps the modern state of Star Trek gather its feet under itself and gain more direction overall than a lot of previous Star Trek shows have given us. Yes, I've heard Picard season three is great. I haven't gotten to it yet because I quit halfway through season two because of how much it just felt like a turd being shoved down my throat. But let's quickly talk about the trailer news because if you're a Stephen King fan, you should be excited for Boogeyman, which got its first trailer and looked pretty spoopy. Horror from the perspective of children always tends to hit different, and with Stephen King behind it, I'm hopeful that it will manage to capture that vibe of just crawling under your skin and making you feel real bad. But even more so, I want to talk about Moon Garden, which is a trailer that was brought to my attention by my Twitch stream as we were gathering the fantasy news this morning, and it looks awesome, combining stop motion and this fantastical surrealism with framing around a child's supposed hospitalization and possible death. Everything about this trailer screams of high effort, working within the constraints of a smaller budget, and it has a criminally small amount of views on the trailer. So if you are interested in some possibly alternative takes on the fantastical genre and things that just reek of passion projects with stop motion animation, it kind of has to be, definitely check this one out. And in the last story of the day, if you are a Cosmere secret project, like blind person, you don't want to know the names or titles, leave right now because in five, four, three, two, one, we're gonna be talking about the cover reveal for the Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England. And the cover looks like this, and I think that kind of aligns with exactly the vibe it needs to go for. I like covers that have like stylized text artistically woven in with props to be the cover. They're not my favorite though. So I would rank this among just good enough. That's good. I'm more interested in the title than the cover. Although I think they knew that, and that's why they made the title the cover. I'm on to you. But this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. I got books. I will have another merch drop in the future and have a good one, y'all. Peace.